All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the January 23, I believe, um, 2019 meeting of the uh, Offline and Local Collaboration Working Group in the IPFS community. So excited to have you all here. Um, figured we'd spend the beginning, again, doing intros. We're, we're kind of still forming our community, so want to make sure that we, we each know the places people are coming from. Um, and then we have an update on our Q1 OKRs to talk about kind of any in-flight work that's happening and make sure that we're aligned. We're trying to finalize our OKRs right now. And then um, spend some time talking about some notable um, movement in the ecosystem that we've been seeing, stuff that's getting us excited. Um, and then if anyone has updates from other areas of the world, um, I see that Carissa just joined us. And um, I think it would be useful for, for people to talk a little bit more about um, areas that they're excited about in kind of offline plus IPFS, any intersections there, or just in general, um, exciting work that's happening in like the offline um, local first ecosystem. Sound good? If there's any other agenda items, um, I will re-add the doc to the chat. So feel free to jump in there and add any other agenda items um, that people think would be useful. But let's start with intros, intros and interests. I'm Molly, um, I'm captain of the Local Offline Collaboration Working Group. Um, I'm super excited about how we can use um, IPFS and similarly um, distributed technology to help people in um, places with poor internet connectivity get access to all of our knowledge that exists on the internet and use it to collaborate and um, work together uh, without having to go over these really long haul internet connections in order to share content with each other. Uh, so that's me. Um, Dominic, you wanna go next? Sure, uh, I'm Dominic. I work for Protocol Labs, mostly on GoIPFS. Um, basically gonna just mimic what Molly said there. Uh, super stressed out personally whenever offline things don't work and you know they there's no reason they shouldn't so i'm, I'm trying to work towards that and, and also see what other people are doing to work towards that effort so that's me cool jim you want to give a blurb sure uh i'm working uh on a peer pad and uh one of our tasks is to make it work offline i've built some offline web stuff before for that project so uh, I can talk about that as well. Awesome, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so I'm Jonathan. I've been working on my own um, kind of like uh, internet in a backpack project for Bacuous, and uh, I'm also collaborating with uh, another project that's doing like disaster recovery um, communications tools, and then I'm just like pretty active on uh, Scuttlebutt and experimenting with like local art communities in uh, New York City uh, and how offline first um, and like peer to peer power structures affect those communities and help them and whatnot. Awesome. Thanks for coming back. Um, Raul, do you want to go, Barb? Uh, we're doing intros, right? Yeah, we're saying intros kind of. Um, how we're, we're engaged and excited about the IPFS and offline cool. communities, um, any intersection or non-intersection. Uh, <laughs> awesome. So this is Raul from the LibbyDB team. Um, I'm very interested in offline uh, for a very long time. In my final year project, I built a university. This was 13 years ago, I think. I built a social network that revolved around Bluetooth on mobile devices using J2ME back at the time and really old Sony Ericsson devices and a very bad programming environment uh, for those. So it, it was pretty fun. Uh, it then used um, web, ser uh, it used web services and at the time and um, RDF and Fold to create profiles of the encounters that you were having with people. Uh, cross them with your calendar events and then contextualize those encounters and upload them to sort of like a social network to create a social graph w without any user input, just by user encounters. So uh, this is like the, my, the project that in the past is a, a bit more relevant to this area, but another thing that I'd like to try to do here is basically represent LibB2B because LibB2B is going to be an extremely important part and a crucial part of everything that, we, that this working group plans to develop. So I'd like to sort of like be that person, maybe that gateway between the P2P and, and this working group. There you go. Awesome, fantastic. <laughs> Harry, do you wanna give a intro? 
Sure. My name is Terry Chadborn. I work at Protocol Labs as a community manager, and a big chunk of my role there is as a maintainer for ProtoSchool, which is a community that is trying to introduce people to decentralized web concepts in a really friendly and inviting and beginner-friendly way. Um, and I also, in the near future, will be managing a medium publication that will have a place to share some use cases and stories about the decentralized web. So that's one thing I think we could do in this group is to tell some of those stories to kind of spread the good word. So I'd be happy to help with that. Um, but I actually know a lot more about Offline First than I do about Decentralized. I'm a co-organizer of an event called Offline Camp, which is sort of a tech retreat for people who are excited about making stuff work offline and in crappy networking conditions. So that includes some people who care about Decentralized and plenty who don't. Um, everyone's welcome. Um, and just sort of more broadly as an organizer for that Offline First community, I do manage a, a publication in that space as well, which is also a place as we wait for the other pub to get set up, but we can also tell some of those offline first stories. So I'm uh, around if anybody has stories to tell, feel free to ping me. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Arkady, you wanna give a quick intro? Yes, hi, so yeah, I work at a protocol, uh, mostly as a collaborations manager person, but I also help out on CurePad, uh, so what, what Jim works on, and we've, uh, definitely making pushes to get it working offline and we had some good news recently very happy about that um uh, also jonathan i just followed you on twitter and i'm shocked that i didn't already it seems like we should be like very connected to like new york arts tech world like sfpc prime British, all that stuff so nice to meet you awesome forming new connections already fantastic um, Chris, are you in a place where you can unmute and give us a, an intro and talk a little bit about um, what your organization works on? Hi, my name is Carissa. Um, I'm a project lead for the DAT project. And for the past year or so, I, well, just a quick for the DAT, the DAT project is um, like a peer-to-peer -peer sharing protocol, uh, similar to IPFS. Um, and I've been working um, with digital democracy primarily for the past year and a half. Um, we deploy a desktop application and mobile application that is decentralized and offline for communities in Peru and uh, Ecuador. Um, mostly. <clears throat> also trying to expand into Colombia and Brazil, uh, Haiti and Guyana, as well as parts of Africa. Um, so our tools work mostly offline. Uh, <clears throat> they require some uh, like initial setup, but most of it is uh, just laptops and mobile phones only. Um, there are no like servers or anything you have to set up, no backpacks you have to carry, um, anything like that, just just the devices themselves. They talk to each other over MDNS. Um, and so basically we're just trying to get a bit of a picture of what other people are doing in the space and seeing how our technology might interface with things like P2P or other kinds of tech that are trying to do the same thing. Um, seems like there's a lot of overlap. Awesome, cool. Uh, excited to have you in this forum as well. Um, so let's let's spend a little bit more time, I think, in kind of the later half of, of this meeting talking about kind of like opportunities to work together or any more specific questions that come out from there. Um, but also wanted to spend some time um, quickly looking over the Q and OKRs that we've drafted for ourselves to make sure that feel good about them as a working group, if there's any other things that um, kind of are coming up that people feel like they're prioritizing um, this quarter. Uh, again, we're kind of an open forum. We're happy to bring in more um, key results that people are gonna be delivering um, that are aligned with the, the work we're trying to do. Um, so let me just share my screen really quickly. Um, all right, can folks, can folks see our local offline collab OKR sheet? Yes. Is it readable? Is it too tiny? I can make it a little bit bigger. A little bigger. Yeah, that's better, I think. Cool. Um, so we kind of have three main buckets in our in our OKRs right now, which are really kind of related to the charter of this working group, which is one, forming our community and, and presence. Um, and we're actually, we already have um, 
kind of one reference material that we've published as a working group that's um, kind of getting good visibility, which is a talk I gave at um, the London IPFS meetup um, last quarter, which we published to YouTube, I think like two weeks ago now, um, that's gotten I think 93 views as of when I checked this morning. Um, so, you know, slowly percolating into the world, people are starting to, to um, get a sense of kind of what we're thinking of and that hopefully is also a route through which they actually come and start chatting to us as a working group. Um, so again, forming our, our presence in community is the first objective. Um, the next is kind of a knitting our research process. And so this is, I think, an area where there's awesome opportunity to collaborate across a number of organizations, which is um, doing kind of a census of um, the many, many applications that are developing in this, in this space and kind of the pain points and needs um, and taxonomy of how they're approaching this. Um, and also um, working with other groups. So for example, like the um, Dynamic Data Capabilities Group and um, other, other areas, maybe lib P2P, to talk about like actually publishing some of the best practices, um, the ways that people are, um, are engaging in this space, and hopefully also defining like RFPs for fixing some of these pain points. Um, and so that's something that I've also kind of like put myself on the hook for, um, role as like a, a partner in maybe drafting um, a work plan of some sort that we can kind of help have other people throughout the community improve our ability inside IPFS, the P2P, the wider ecosystem um, to improve some of these tooling. Um, and kind of one that, one that comes to mind already is um, this idea of having um, like peer-to-peer -peer discovery without having to choose some um, already set up uh, Wi-Fi network or something like that. Um, and there were a number of conversations last week uh, um, in the lib P2P week about Bluetooth on Friday. And so we're going to have another chat because uh, Raul was already gone and I was also not there in these meetings. So we're going to have another chat later this week. If you're super excited about um, a Bluetooth or equivalent kind of peer-to-peer -peer local discovery transport in lib P2P, um, we'll find a time for um, that sync to happen with some folks on the lib P2P side and I'm happy to have more people in that conversation. Um, I'm kind of coming at it from the point of like, what, what do we need to exist from a product perspective? Um, but if others have more technical constraints, um, that would be really useful to include as well. Um, yeah, and our final objective is um, engaging with the wider community. And I feel like that's already starting to happen, which is great organically um, in this meeting. Um, but Terry has an objective around actually um, setting a date for uh, the next offline camp, which I'm super excited to attend, and I'm sure many people in this forum are uh, champing at the bit to get on board as well, um, but also engaging with other organizations um, to make sure that as we boot this group and um, do this research that uh, we're learning from their best practices and collaborating as much as possible. So um, anyone have, you know, that's kind of walking through what we have. It's very similar to what we had at the end of last quarter. Um, anyone have any ideas, edits, corrections, suggestions, stuff that they're working on that they want to see documented here, or do they want to add themselves as like, hey, I want to help contribute to some of these, these efforts? Would you like a quick update on mine? Would love one. That'd be great. So as I'm a, a one of four or five co-organizers for Offline Camp, and between us, we've had conversations with a few companies already who may be interested in sponsoring Offline Camp or collaborating in various ways. So we're excited about that. I don't think any of them so far have been uh, specifically interested in decentralized, but we love the support for our Offline First in general, which is the focus of this event. So that's been really nice to see. Um, and also, this one goes towards the... There's one about publishing the reference materials one on line six. Um, so I know Molly has an article in mind that we'll probably put out through the offline first publication, kind of building on a talk that she gave recently. Um, but I also reached out to Jonah at Project Lantern, and he is planning to connect me, um, not immediately, but once things slow down a little over there with someone on their team who may be able to write something also for that for that offline first pub to share a bit about the project they're working on, which is really cool. Yeah. Jonathan, which is, which, you actually, which is at that borderline, yeah. You actually collaborate with Project Lantern, right? So um, some overlap there. In case, in case Terry, you need another, another mind to uh, pull into this conversation, he has a lot of really great insights. Fantastic. Yeah, Anyone else? Any questions specifically about that, um, or if like Jonah's over, committed to other things, just feel free to ping me. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. Awesome. Anyone else have, have items on their agenda um, they want to, or questions about kind of what we're prioritizing? I do want to say I'm pretty excited about Row 11, uh, performing the census of uh, what's out there currently and finding a taxonomy that we, such that we can classify exactly in, in a structured manner what these projects are, are currently working on and how we can best support them and how we can all collaborate that. I think that's going to be a great strategy for, for a lot of discussions as well. And finding gaps in the space as well that, you know, that potential initiatives might help to fill in. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's there's good opportunity there also to collaborate some of the work that Arcadi's been doing, just trying to reach out to lots of people in the IPFS ecosystem who are, um, you know, using that tooling for a whole ton of uh, different use cases, like the offline use case in particular is an area that maybe we can collaborate on. Um, doing that on ramp and sourcing back like the, the findings we have of what pain points are to um, kind of to kill two birds with one stone. Uh, we can both take advantage of, of those insights. Awesome. Well, um, given, given we don't have any uh, burning like corrections to make, um, love that we have uh, enthusiasm about this, but I think we'll um, consider our OKRs uh, finalized for this quarter and we're you know already in, in flight on actually executing on them, which is great, um, but I'll update our OKR issue seeing check mark. We're, we're good to go from our Q1 OKR perspective, which is great. Um, so switching back to kind of the next item of business, um, I did want to talk a little bit more and understand from folks who maybe more from an application perspective have been thinking about kind of the, the needs for like peer-to-peer -peer discovery and tooling um, since there was this conversation that started a little bit last week around Bluetooth and libp2p and that's going to be continuing on this week. Um, Carissa, Jonathan, others in the, the application space, if you have learnings or insights around um, from kind of peer-to-peer -peer node discovery perspective, what sort of transports um, you found really useful or have been difficult um, would be useful to encapsulate those perspectives um, into what we've been talking about there. Um, kind of the two main use cases I've been seeing in my head trying to, to bucket them is um, one kind of like the DAP use case of um, you have two, two nodes with, um, for example, uh, maybe textile is a good example where you have like this mobile um, photo sharing application, you have two nodes, and they both go offline, and then they are, they happen to be within Bluetooth distance of each other, or they're actually on the same um, partitioned network. So they're not connected to the rest of the network, but they're both in the same area. How do I, using the same DAP that, you know, maybe already is configured in some way, um, find these two nodes and enable them to form a, a channel and share content back and forth. So, we, you know, we, in our little happy DAP um, edge of the world, deserted island case can still share photos uh, back and forth on, on textile. Um, whereas the other case is, um, you know, I, I'm completely offline and I want to like sync a set of content between my phone and my computer, maybe not even using the same um, distributed application, but like, hey, it would be great if we, instead of having to open this file um, on every single one of my offline devices before I go on my plane flight, uh, then I could just, you know, make sure it's cached on one and then magically get access to all of those same content from every different one of my devices or anyone who is near, nearby with me. Um, so those are two, two use cases I've been thinking about. Are there others that are near and dear to people's hearts that don't seem to fit into that space? Um. Yeah, so <clears throat> we've been working with communities primarily that exist entirely offline. So villages in the middle of the jungle where it takes like eight hours on a canoe to get there. Um, and they've been doing a lot of work with collecting data about oil spills um, and um, also doing mapping of their territories like animal tracks and things that are in the jungle. and. It's really important for all of this stuff to work offline and also be able to synchronize the same sets of data and changes to that data um, in a two-way fashion. So um, not just thinking about like my personal data being accessible when I'm offline, but actually being able to change data while I'm offline 
and then synchronize those changes with someone else who's potentially changed the same exact data while they're offline. So this is a case of similar to Git or other kinds of version control systems. Yeah, like CRDTs um, using that like conflict-free data type stuff. Well, in this case, I don't, CRDTs can be useful, but often people want to be able to resolve the merge conflicts themselves because it's like a collaborative environment where maybe a CRDT will do like 50 or 75% of it, but. Uh. <clears throat> gotcha. Good. That's a good clarification. Another one that I'm thinking about is particularly for these remote locations and so on that are potentially within this context that Carissa is, is describing, collecting data or are generating data in isolated locations as they travel around a potential potentially a country, right? Then they come in contact, they come in view of other devices that are able to then transport that data further on up to yeah. a single point where it can be connected. This is very similar to sneaker nets, you know, concept of sneaker nets and very similar yes. to scuttlebutt itself, right? So this ability to relay data across, and across a federated network that can potentially reach its final destination as people travel yes. physically. And for this, we're using um, USB sticks um, primarily for this. One of the things that we really want and don't have is a way to read and write data from the node process directly to a USB that is inserted into the micro USB of the phone. So in Latin America it's really common for people to have a USB stick that has a micro USB on one side and a regular USB that goes into the computer on the other. So you can stick the micro USB into one um, phone, put the data onto it, and then uh, put that into a computer on the other side. Um, so there aren't really good libraries for doing that right now. Pretty much is, it has to be written in Java um, to write data directly there. Also, I think for serial, serializing data to disk and then reading it back out, um, we've kind of created our own ad hoc methods for doing that over Hypercore, which is um, a different thing from IPFS, but maybe that's something that um, you might be interested in. And we've gotcha. also been looking at Bluetooth and um, Andre Stoltz has been doing some really awesome, amazing work with Bluetooth recently. Um, so there's a Node.js Bluetooth um, that connects to React Native and uh, they have it working with Manyverse, which is the Scuttlebutt mobile app. Gotcha. Thank you. And are most of, so Chris, you, you have mostly kind of like a, a setup that has like some, some percent mobile phones and some percent laptops. Um, is, mm -hmm. are those all like uh, recent enough devices that they're Bluetooth enabled? Because I know there's definitely a problem in um, some areas of uh, the offline world in which like even Bluetooth isn't something that you can um, expect most mobile phones to be enabled with. Yeah. Um, mo yeah. The mobile phones that, that people have have Bluetooth enabled. Um, yeah, if you think about it as, for, for us, it's we, we work with particular partners um, or people who are, you know, under-resourced, maybe they can't buy their own phone at all, so uh, we provide people with phones. So we provide them with later, uh, you know, $100 Moto G4s or whatever, but they still, they're pretty good, actually have Bluetooth and pretty good GPS as well. Absolutely. Oh, well, I actually had one other use case idea that was percolating, and I think this one's particularly um, notable for lip P2P, and I, um, I think we discussed it um, last quarter at some point, um, which is the, I'm actually fully connected to a network, um, and I have an okay connection, but the content that I want um, happens to be at a peer that's local to me, um, and so it's possible for me to, say, sync this content lo locally instead of going over the network for some call. Um, and this is kind of the, how do, how do I have like peer prioritization when trying to find um, content um, where some of, some of these will have like a lower cost for me from like in a range of ways, like maybe it's faster, maybe it just, it's gonna be less costly for my data plan, like other, other options like that. Um, so how can I do some sort of like local first check when trying to find some content um, on the network? Yeah, totally. That, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's similar to, I would say, the concept of airdrop as well on Max, right? Where you can always like have use a internet service to 
transfer that data across those two devices, but if you happen to be co-localized, then AirDrop just magically works, right? So it's uh, somewhat similar to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, I don't remember if I mentioned this on the previous call, but at one of the offline camps recently, some of the attendees built something they call PeerDrop, which is for all devices, not just, uh, Mac related, <laughs> Apple related stuff, which was kind of cool. So it was built using some sort of peer to peer stuff. I could try to find the link if anyone's interested. Cool. I'd be super interested. That's uh, my uh, classic uh, problem uh, having both, both devices. I have a, an Android and iOS, and like they never talk to each other. It's the worst. I'll see I end up having to up. sync all of my photos to Google Photos, which is not the, like, the solution <laughs> I want in order to transfer them from one phone to another. Um, I'm, I'm super interested in the bootstrapping problem where a lot of these solutions um, require at least some sort of, you know, connecting and down, like pre-downloading the applications or figuring out a way to uh, share applications that one person has with someone else easily. Um, you know, the, like, F-Droid is kind of interesting because you can just have files on USB sticks and share it that way. And you can share from your phone to another, like if two people are on the local network and they have F-Droid open, they can actually share applications to each other. Um, so figuring out ways, like what's the minimum assumption we can make both of like certain uh, phone, like mobile devices and um, computers or like constraints around, okay, I want to make, uh, I want peer drop, right? But like, how do I get peer drop to my friend? Or I want to chat, but I don't want them to have to like download and install like X code command line tools just to, you know, or like open up the app store. So um, figuring out, you know, what, what exists already on these operating systems that could be like the entry point for sharing these really cool applications that when, you know, we're on this, video call, I can go and open tab after tab after tab and then download and try all these things. Um, but if I'm just in a room with someone and we don't have a network connection, like how do I do that? Yeah, one that I saw in the ecosystem, kind of along those lines, um, showed up on Y Combinator a couple days ago, which is this um, Firefox add-on to read. Um, and it effectively acts like a pocket backed by an IPFS node or a set of IPFS nodes um, so that you can like pin articles that you want to read. You get an IPFS hash and, um, you know, stores this content, you know, potentially to the local IPFS node you have running on your machine, um, which means that even if that website disappears or changes the article or takes the article down, you still have that like readable article format um, being hosted, like pinned on your own local machine benefit. It also means that if you go offline and you want to, to read that content, like you can continue to access that and effectively your entire to read pocket list is free cached offline for you, um, which is super cool. And then I was thinking, well, it would be really great if it wasn't just you know, me with my device and my local IPFS node, but it's any of the devices that are connected to my local IPFS node. Um, problem there is they need to know the hash. They need to know the hash of this file and the particular hash of the file that I downloaded offline at that particular time and who knows what other um, dynamic content um, would be added to some website such that the hash one moment to another might be slightly different because they're showing a different ad on this, um, uh, on this particular article or something like that. Um, and so now, now you have this extra challenge of how do I effectively advertise to the people, uh, to the nodes that I'm connected to, hey, by the way, I've cached this content, this hash offline, and this hash is interesting. Like it's kind of this pub sub use case of like, hey, I wanna, I wanna publish, like I have interesting articles. Feel free to browse through my interesting articles. Um, and anyone who's connected to me can, can find these instead of me having to like have a QR code that I have on my laptop and like use the QR code with like a mobile phone reader to pass that hash from one to the other. Um, or I have to be running orbit and I have to chat the hash from one, um, one, one device to another device in order to be able to open that up. So that was like a case where I was like, oh, it's like, it's kind of doing this thing that I love, but I wish it could be doing so much more. 
so um, M- MDNS is kind of interesting for this, right? Like if if you have a personal homepage and that is just a collection of things you'd like to share with people locally and you know you're running a web server on whatever device that you have um simply like advertising to the network in any number of ways right so you can first advertise that like oh there's a web server running and uh here's the the name of that server and it's just like your local laptop or phone um but you can get even more like i don't want to say invasive but um (laughs) more more sharing uh, like more brightly sharing by um, like running a Samba file server and that will show up in people's like uh, windows uh, like in Finder, in Nautilus and uh, in Windows Explorer you can like see the share there and and you know it's another like kind of side channel right it's not um, but it, it, but it comes with the operating system and it's kind of assumed to be there. Um, and you can just figure out ways that you want to have shortcuts. And once you have like a shortcut that someone can link to or a hash that someone can link to or a web page they can go to that might be served up in your machine, then, um, then it's opened up to like, yeah, you can have installers, you can have uh, more rich applications. Um, but I think MDNS is like a really solid uh, way of starting out, whereas like most of the Bluetooth things that I see, what's awesome about Bluetooth is right, it's a second radio, so um, you don't need to necessarily like if you are connected to a network over Wi-Fi, like th- this is just like a side channel, but um, almost everything I've seen on Bluetooth that isn't like a crazy hack, and correct me if I'm wrong because I haven't done a lot of Bluetooth work, but like they they require like a very clear I am connecting to device A, I'm connecting to device B, now what are our capabilities? Whereas like uh MBNS kind of does that. Yeah, so there's having like the pairing there's cost trade offs. Right? There's trade offs. I mean with Bluetooth the cool thing is uh auto discovery is a new a new thing that's actually possible. Um so that's becoming less of an issue. Well, could you share what auto discovery is? Yeah, so um, as long as you have Bluetooth turned on, you can be discovered by other devices and you don't have to do the pairing. Uh, can, can you share data with auto discovery passively or does it still require like, a, oh, I found this device, I want to do something now? Um, I'm, I haven't actually used it myself, um, but I just recently saw that, um, so basically there's a, I forget what it's called, but there's like a, a, a next generation Bluetooth, I think it might be Bluetooth 3 or Bluetooth X or B- XYZ. B- BLE, you said? Bluetooth BLE, Bluetooth. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. and it's, you know, it's. I think it was mostly created for like sports fitness stuff originally. Like, oh, I like auto discover my uh, watch or something like that. But um, you can also send data over it. Um, so people are starting to hack that. Um, and that's what the Manyverse that I was talking about before, mm-hmm. the mobile app that incorporates Bluetooth is doing with auto discovery. I haven't tried it myself, but they do say it has auto discovery and sends data with that a lot of uh, headache. The problem that we've had with MDNS is that some routers block it, and actually quite a few. I mean, it's quite common, especially in uh, public spaces or community centers or shared Wi-Fi spaces, which is a lot of where people are gonna be accessing the internet when they're offline primarily. Um, so that was been one of, our, one of the issues we've encountered. That's uh, painful but good to hear. <laughs> um, I, I tried a few of these chat applications that uh, I mean, I have Manyverse, but I, I didn't test that one out um, locally. But I tested out uh, Briar, and uh, there was an- another one that um, Jonah from Lantern was talking with the creators of. And I think I'll try and 
forget the name of it. Um, and Briar actually worked fantastically with no network connection. Um, it, it fell back to Bluetooth for communication. Um, and it just worked regardless of the partitions we created locally. Um, and that was pretty impressive because I haven't seen, you know, anything else do that. So it'd be interesting to see if it's using um, auto discovery in Bluetooth or, or something else that I wrote. Do you have a link to, to this? I haven't heard of it. Yeah. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, Briar, I, I will find a link to Briar and the one that didn't work for me. <laughs> yeah. Useful to keep track of all of them. Um, Jim, I'm curious. So we've talked uh, about a couple of different areas of use cases. Um, curious if um, there are any coming from kind of the peer pad world or other areas that um, you have visibility into that you think is a, an important use case for us to be prioritizing. Um, I think just the peer pad, it's, it's a way of arranging the CRDTs for building collaborative apps. And, uh, you know, it gives you all the, you know, you need that ability when you're going online and offline and people are editing the same document and how to sync things together. So um, I, I, I think uh, one of the main selling pe features to get people interested in, in PeerBase, which is the library underneath PeerPad, is going to be uh, talking about the offline use case and getting some really easy to, to use demos. Um, I've done some uh, separate demos with that that used uh, like React Native and uh, that was pretty pretty interesting because I could share code and uh, do CRTT stuff in, in that ecosystem. So I want to do the same sort of demos with uh, uh, peer, peer base. Awesome. Yeah, actually, do you want to describe the, um, the dev effort you were doing to um, make it so that you're kind of like listening for a like new peer pad files that come online and caching them such that if the device that wrote the set of notes goes offline, but they've shared the link with someone else, they can kind of um, stay being hosted even if the original um, creator is offline. Yeah, the, the, the previous um, projects I've done where I've done offline, we're not trying to do like separate channels of communication while offline. So it's just sort of your classic, you know, put your, plane, your phone in airplane mode be able to edit the documents, you, you know, come back online um, in sync. Um, so there's the whole whole other aspect of using like Bluetooth or something to connect with, create, to create on the on the fly ad hoc networks. That, that's not something I've explored. Uh, yeah, um, but kind of the the relay server that you guys had had set up to. Um, for example, like I create this and I, if I am connected to the rest of the network when I create something, um, even if I go offline and I'm no longer seeding the, the peer pad file, uh, there is another uh, dev server that's like listening and relaying. Oh, oh yeah, so, so for peer, peer pad specifically, we have a concept of a pinner, which, um, so, which uh, you know, you write your document and it'll sync it to the pinner and it tells you a little notification there, it's been synced. And then you you know you can go offline because you might want to edit the same document with somebody else, but you might not be online at the same time. So you really really need that. <laughs> um, if the pinner wasn't there, you would both have to be online at the same time in order to synchronize. So. Yeah, I feel like the um, right the way that I've seen you guys do this more from like a UX perspective of like messaging this offline transfer um, is particularly, um, you know, it, it's highlighting this, this shifting model of like, oh, it's not about one single server that like I must be connected to at all times. And it's um, like this binary online offline, but it's kind of these two layers of like, it has, you know, it's saving to my device. It's, you know, being replicated by some other network and then it's being um, seen by other nodes that are collaborating. Yeah, I think that's the, the UX challenge is going to be really, I, I think the UX challenge has to go uh, hand in hand with like teaching people the concepts because uh, like literacy, because people are used to standard client server model is the website out posted in the data center somewhere. And uh, they just assume that they've entered stuff in the web form and it's all saved for them. 
but in in a, a true peer to peer model um, like who who's running the infrastructure like everybody's running the infrastructure like if if the pinner's not there, you can still collaborate uh, but but the data might not be around if everybody's not online so how do people people need to understand that and uh, if the UI is not clear about it, if the UI is trying to make it look like it's the classic web model, um, I think that's almost like an injustice. Like people will assume that their data is safe or that their data is getting where they think their data is getting, but the data might not actually be getting there because they've never been asked to learn the topology. Like they don't, they don't understand that there's no server in the mix. Um, but I think then, that's, uh, sorry, uh, continue. But then, but then we do have these pinners, which are sort of servers. So it's sort of confusing in some ways. But like the pinner is not like your classic web service. The, the pinner only stores encrypted content. The pinner knows nothing. Like it can't access the, the content without the keys. So it's like people have to sort of understand key management, which is like, I, I don't. I, I don't want to try to explain this to my parents yet. Maybe uh, six months from now. I don't know. So I'm wondering if pinning is one of those key concepts that would make sense for proto school. Like we're get. We've had a lot of cool proposals recently for more advanced tutorials where I feel like there's a little bit of scaffolding messaging. And someone else. At, as I was talking about a different tutorial recently, someone else was like, yeah, but the pinning thing is going to be confusing and they'll think it's this way and it's not. So that's something that might be interesting to kind of build a layer in. Um, in the offline first, like offline camp, we've talked a lot about this sort of the user experience of being offline. And here it's even more complicated with being decentralized. This like, is my data safe? Is it not? Is it comparable to some version of saving I've ever heard of. So that like coming up with the vocabulary, like the user experience vocabulary for that is one of the things that we've worked on in that community that maybe we could help with here. I'd be really interested in engaging in that conversation, Terry. I've been trying to wrap my own head around all of the different pinning models that IPFS um, supports. And I'm sure there's even other examples um, in, in other parts of the distributed um, kind of space of how to think about this and how to think about which pinning strategy would make the most sense for your application or your personal need or um, whatever it is and, and how to reason about that uh, given what are some, some like obvious things that you would think of but how to translate it into what you need technically uh, in your setup. Um, is like something I've been thinking about and would love to, you know, think about that in a space with other humans who have their, their own perceptions and ideas. Yeah, and I'm someone who doesn't understand it, but I'm happy to be the guinea pig that you try to explain it to me and I try to explain it back in English. And then you say, oh no, oh dear, no, let's try again. And we just go back and forth. Jim? Yeah, specifically with pinning, like peering into the feature, the way I think it's going to end up working is this going to be, it's going to actually tie into your like identity. Like when you go on your phone, you'd be like all the apps, all the websites and things you interact with that are distributed, they'll connect to your, your identity somehow, or your, you might have like a box at home that you store all your files on. Um, and you just, every, every app you want to use, um, the, the files somehow get uh, pinned back at home. But you might be like, you might work for a company and your company might be say, hey, everything you work on at work, we will also keep replicas of it around. And there's going to be, have to be like these sort of little channels connected. And I think when the, when the whole future sort of happens, um, it's people will, have, people will need to understand the concepts for when it goes wrong. But if everything goes right, they won't really have to deal with it. Like it'll just be sort of like, they can be really sort of lazy with how they manage the data. So that's sort of the dream. Yeah, we've been thinking about this also in the offline case because when people do get to internet, they want to uh, send their files to some backup server, but <clears throat> for them, it feels more like a backup. Um, and so that's how we've been talking about it. 
um, it's like, uh, it's a backup server that doesn't have, it's like no knowledge, it doesn't have access to your data, but there's a backup somewhere. And if, when you come, if you ever lose your phone or like something bad happens, um, it's there if you have the key somewhere to open it later. Um, so trying to, I think that you're right in that way that there is going to be some knowledge of key management um, that will have to be, at least in this stage, um, have to be have to be known. But it can be kind of explained like if there's a safe with your data somewhere, you kind of have to keep the key. You might want to keep a copy of your key somewhere like under your bed or something. That's the only key that can have access to that safe. This, this discussion that we're having and the way that we started talking about transports, we continue talking about services, we continue talking about UX, and now we're talking about the data plane itself. You know, it's making me think that really we should be striving to maybe conceptualize a stack, a reference stack, uh, so that we can have discussions that target, you know, specific areas. And these areas can evolve and we can tease out what's behind them, what what's available, what is the state of the art, what are the projects that have addressed, you know, novel aspects, and for example, the data plane, you know, it can, data, the data plane can revolve around pinner services, can revolve around a number of things, federated services, whatever, and like there are, there are so many approaches, so many architectures behind, and designs behind these things that it might, and maybe this is what you're hinting, like maybe it ties into the concept of a taxonomy as well for projects, right? So I'm thinking about, like, it's coming to my mind, you know, when you normally, like, when you look around, um, and you see architecture diagrams and you see, you know, sta like stack diagrams. Um, I think it could be interesting to build a common vocabulary so that around, you know, the different layers uh, that compose the offline endeavor. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. sure that everyone has a different uh, picture in their head when they hear the word pin based on their personal interactions with pinning things based on, you know, how they think about the technology itself and its influence. Um, Ingrid Burrington uh, gave a lot of really good classes on um, thinking about networks. Uh, uh, her and um, Surya Mathieu, uh, who's uh, an interesting artist and researcher, um, that had pe that uh, I ran through their class like they shared they published their class and then I went and at IBEAM um, taught it to uh, a bunch of high schoolers um, or no they were middle school yeah they were really young um, that was thinking about networking and thinking about networks and like we started with like pipe cleaners and uh, like foam blocks and modeled out the physical like what is connecting and how they're connecting um, and then talked about, okay, so then what are you actually sharing? You know, like it might be sharing a picture from your phone. It might be sharing your location, whatever, how that gets someplace. And then there is definitely space within that modeling exercise and within that class um, to uh, talk about, you know, or to at least introduce the concepts, not like describe the entire thing, but introduce the concept of, um, you know, this is the information you're sharing, but you might only want to share it with one person. So we like wrap it up in a, in a lock and you could, you don't, you don't have to go so into detail about key exchange and key encryption, but it won't feel unnatural if someone wants to uncover what's happening. If you kind of like give those hooks in the context of other parts of the, the stack and context of other parts of, of you know, um, learning. Uh, the goal of that exercise was just to talk about power structures and how they reflect like physicality of spaces. But um, the at the end of it, uh, the students had a much stronger like working knowledge of you know uh, broadcasting SSIDs and what it means to connect to a network and things like that. Um, they, didn't, they didn't seem to trip up on the like individual concepts so much. Yeah, I think there's a really interesting question there of like. Um, what are the, the base underlying concepts that we can really easily transfer to users of these networks that just like feels um, intuitive and what things can we like, you know, manage to hide under the hood and 
um, not force all of the users of, of these tools to have to think about in their heads because um, there's definitely, there's some stuff that like it's going to need to be exposed. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to debug your system and figure out what's going wrong. Um, but there's a lot of complexity here. Um, and I think there's, there's like a line we're going to have to walk in best practices for these tools to communicate the right subset of things that make things intuitive and have the like a, an easy to approach understanding of how things are working. Yeah, I would just stay away from metaphors as much as possible because uh, like it's really easy while teaching to underestimate the ability of the people who are learning and to try and that, that feeling to try and hide the complexity because you know it's okay to give like misinformation um, in the sense that like you're sh sharing um, an incomplete picture of what's happening, but to, you know, it, it's great if one of the students says that's, you know, that's not wholly correct or they discover later that you, you lied about what a file was, you know, like, like a really good exercise is to answer the question, what is a file, right? I got asked this in one of my classes and it was the best class I ever had because like, I thought I had a good grasp on what a file was. And there are so many ways to think about it and so many ways to share that thinking and explore it that like, you know, some students were, you know, let's open up a file in, like let's open up the sound file in uh, paint and let's like uh, open up this picture in Audacity and, and like start like just changing bits in a text editor and, and really just like, what does it mean to, you know, have a name for a file. Where is that stored? Like all these things. Um, it's okay that there's fractal complexity and, and as long as like they know why they're learning this and if it's to like implement a cool application, then you only need to go as far as, as you know, what is the bare minimum concepts, which I think a couple of us have tried to like say it'd be really nice to just have a like a word cloud, a stack, a, a, a matrix of, of similar concepts and how we're defining them so that um, it's it's not just assumed that anyone coming into this space will know all the vocabulary. And, and not just for that, because uh, also for us internally, because it's going to help us reason about implications of a particular transport, for example, as a particular, I don't know, pinning strategy, right? How do I first get to the, <laughs> to, to, to the machine that's actually going to pin that data for me, right? Uh, that's going to require some work from the transport itself. And depending on the pitting strategy itself and, you know, the potential latency or the chunking or whatever, that might impact the way that I, you know, display progress to the user on the UX level, right? So really taking a decision at one level of the stack has implications upwards and, and downwards. Or so think of it as a stack, as a matrix, whatever you want to, you know, whatever form, shape you want to give it at this point. But it really, it cross-links. There are cross-links. Uh, across the entire, you know, domain that, um, and yeah, that, that just need to be modeled out and reasoned about, right? So having a common vocabulary to find those different, those, those like implications is, would be awesome. Fantastic. So we're just, just about out of time. We have one minute left, but um, kind of a, another item that I've pulled out from this conversation is that we kind of need taxonomies on two different layers. There's a taxonomy of like understanding the many different end use cases that offline applications are trying to support and seeing if we can cluster some of those in the method by which they're trying to solve these needs. And then the taxonomy of like the stack itself and um, how to reason about different components of those applications in a way that we can, um, you know, talk, for example, the one that comes to mind is like the IPFS ecosystem of things and like where the, the thin waste is in this protocol and which things you can plug and play kind of one-to-one -one, um, versus, like, you know, you need something at this layer of the stack and you need to choose something. Um, how do you make that choice and what are the pros and cons of the various options you can slot in there? Um, sounds like we need to find a way to reason ourselves and name these things so that we can communicate effectively. Um, so I've, I've added those in a needs from this group in Q1 section. Um, I think we'll, we'll maybe I'll try and book some time, time with you to just brainstorm what some of these things might be and uh, kind of flesh it out a little bit more. Um, but I thought this was awesome. Thank you all so much for a fantastic second weekend meeting and I'm looking forward to our next one in February.
Thank you, everybody. Take care. See you then. Thanks. Bye. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.